high memories and the influence that um, Toni Morrison and her work in this book has had on me. And then talk a, a little bit about his connection to the Bench Project and NIAC, which some of you may or may not be aware of. And then uh, I was just going to go over some of the many ways in which uh, various scholars have considered uh, this particular uh, book and uh, a film, as you all well know. And then I was just going to list some themes and ideas that, and quotes that jumped out at me and then open it up for just a general uh, discussion. So hopefully that works for uh, all of you. And so um, I'll start by saying that uh, I was not an avid reader in high school, uh, to say the least. And I um, you know, just did what I needed to get by in some of my classes as an undergraduate at Fordham University. But when I took um, a class that was offered called Toni Morrison and others, it really changed my whole academic experience. I saw myself in these books. I thought they were just so well written, um, all, you know, all of Toni Morrison's works that we considered uh, in that class. And they just really just captured you and brought you to whatever time or place, at least that was the impression that I got. And later on, I realized that I wasn't the only one, you know, of course, she's winning national and international awards for her writing, but they're just, you know, some people of various uh, genders, racial backgrounds, et cetera, that go around quoting her works because they uh, you know, love her uh, talent and appreciate uh, her contribution to uh, literature, broadly American literature in particular, and centering um, Black people uh, as well. Uh, and so uh, my connection with um, Toni Morrison and this book project also goes along with the bench project. And so hopefully most of you on this call know that there's a bench that was dedicated in honor of an ex-slave who lived in Nyack, who was a successful uh, businesswoman. And she also, um, from reports, um, ran uh, part of the Underground Railroad or was a potentially a conductor, may have offered a safe haven for um, fugitive uh, indentured people. And so um, this book, Beloved, is really about, not only, but part of it is about memory and about remembering slavery and about remembering the horrific nature of it and experiences uh, of people who were um, living at that particular uh, time. And um, the Toni Morrison Society, who I'm grateful for, is a group of scholars who continue to study um, all of Toni Morrison's many works uh, and the whole various events surrounding it, decided to create a Bench by the Road project uh, to fill the gap uh, where um, uh, having a memorial for people of African ancestry was uh, missing. And so Toni Morrison famously you know, commented about how there was no Bench by the Road where people could sit and think about or not think about the experiences of people formerly held in bondage. And so the Bench Project is a memorial, an outdoor memorial, and serves that uh, function. And so there are less than 30 in the entire world, uh, most in the U.S., and uh, Nyack is one place where uh, that uh, bench is located. And what's even more significant is that because, as some of you may know, Toni Morrison just lived down the road, she was able to attend that uh, community celebration. And so that's extra special that, you know, some of us like uh, Mary White <laughs> have pictures uh, with Toni Morrison or were able to capture the moment you know, of her seeing the uh, bench unveiled. And so I'm grateful for that. Um, as I was thinking about just how uh, beloved that Toni Morrison is in her work, I just wanted to do a quick search using one of the um, databases we have access to at LSU to see the different ways in which people have responded to this particular book and film. And so, um, you know, I go back to it uh, over and over again, and, and sometimes I see things differently or uh, a different sentence pops out to me that perhaps I overlooked before. Uh, so I just was curious to see, you know, what are some scholars saying about uh, her work? And so among some of the themes that emerged from what scholars were writing about, about Beloved, is the impact of slavery. Um, uh, some scholars have written about uh, becoming other, 
Um, some have focused on a culture or identity, uh, even a psychoanalysis uh, of CEPA or CEPI, depending on how you pronounce it. Uh, so there are studies that focus on ethnic segregation uh, based upon the book Beloved, um, articles about motherhood and about grief, about the bond between mothers and daughters, and also about violence. Um, and three other things that, um, that I found that many scholars uh, got out of uh, their reading of Beloved was a focus on African American feminist consciousness. And so that's something that you all may be interested in talking about. And uh, lastly, uh, the two concepts of sacrifice and surrender. And so those were from various disciplines, some of the um, themes to scholarly articles that have been published in the last few decades uh, based upon uh, Beloved. And so before we start our conversation and engage in some of the things that you all want to talk about, I just would um, put together a list of uh, concepts and quotes that jumped out at me and I may talk more about some than others. So feel free to uh, put a comment uh, in the chat box if you'd like me to elaborate or if you have questions. Um, but uh, uh, one thing I thought about was the relationship between uh, Amy and, and Sethi uh, and how you know, Amy appears out of nowhere and helps Sethi so that she can uh, successfully deliver uh, Denver. And they talk about uh, the two being two worthless uh, people. And, you know, we were talking a lot about who and what matters in contemporary times. And so to think back and um, seeing two, two uh, females that are very different in many ways, racially and otherwise, but also seeing themselves or being described as being uh, wor two worthless people. And it also made me think about um, slavery and indentured servants. And so uh, for a time, uh, you did have uh, white people, Native Americans, some black people that were indentured servants as opposed to uh, slaves for life. And so as an indentured servant, there was a, at least um, for many people an end to your, in, your employment, if you will. Um, so, and you might even end up with land after it. But it was still a horrific experience uh, for many people. And so, you know, Tony Marsa gives, gives us a lesson about what it was like for uh, some people who were indent indentured and the, the challenges that they faced, not saying that she's equating it to the system of slavery, but again, nuancing what's happening at this um, particular time and, and illustrating how two people can be so different, but also have some things um, in common. Uh, and some other themes that came to mind uh, for me was uh, memory and haunting. And I also have um, uh, down my list about the supernatural. Uh, and I connect that with understanding religion more broadly and African-American religion. So there are many African-American uh, scho uh, scholars who study religion, uh, who study African-American religion and who study African-American philosophy who um, have also written about Toni Morrison's works, including Beloved. And it's important to note, and it's something that, you know, I learned later in my uh, academic career um, because I was trained in a different discipline, is that you know we should think about religion more broadly, and I think that really comes across in this book. So, as a sociologist and for as lay people in general, when we think about religion, we're oftentimes thinking about um, church, you know, churches, physical structures, houses of worship, and so forth. Uh, even with many of us going uh, online at the present time. But we have people like uh, well-known scholars like um, um, James, uh, sorry, Charles Long, who define religion not as you know the, a building um, or just a set of beliefs, but as an orientation and a way and one's way of understanding their place in the world. And so when you think about religion to that extent, it can encompass far more than uh, we might think originally. So we can think about the material and the non-material. And so um, the, what they're experiencing throughout this novel doesn't seem that like it's um, not plausible. So 
again, so rethinking uh, how we think about religion, especially when we consider um, African American religion. And another point too, to note that we do see some examples that kind of seem reminiscent of what some scholars might call the black church, right? So there are some people who are identified as members of the clergy uh, and their actual you know, churches in the community in this book, uh, but you also um, have other definitions and other people who are engaged in different activities um, that um, are represent a broader understanding. So it's not just black church. So black church does not equal African American religion. It's just one aspect of it. And I think that Toni Morrison communicates that uh, in this book. Um, another thing I thought about in this book was the relationship of, um, well, I wrote men, mothers, and sons. So there's a a number of uh, issues here related to what we might consider masculinities or patriarchies. And I make that plural on purpose because oftentimes, you know, people use terms like masculinity, femininity, um, and patriarchy and apply it to all groups as if it applies to all groups equally. And it really doesn't. And so I think Tony Morrison illustrates that in um, this book as well, which, um, well, I think she illustrates it in this book as well. So in talking about um, manhood for white men, for example, she connects it with violence and with uh, guns as an extension of it. Uh, whereas for black men, you can see that they don't have the same type of uh, control that uh, white men have. They don't have the same kind of uh, power. And even if they want to do something, there's always this threat of violence and they suffer many psychological uh, consequences as a result of it. And again, the women here, um, they're not equally disadvantaged because they're women, right? So you have Mrs. Gardner, um, who is um, not saying she doesn't experience any disadvantage, but her experience is not the same as baby sucks, uh, for example. So just looking at how complicated that is, and then there was a quote, which I didn't write down here, but I plan to revisit at some point where um, it stated that Baby Sooks said, and I, I could go to the pages, but we might all have different books. And I don't remember if it was um, mentioned in the film or not, but you can always double check it. But there's a, a line where um, it says that Baby Sooks said is that a man is just gonna be a man, but a son is somebody. And so I thought that was deep, maybe because I have two sons <laughs> or I see the relationship between uh, my brother and my mother and, or other people. But it is uh, interesting. And I was thinking about this um, within the context of Black Lives Matter and within um, historically with regards to um, the killing of Black men and how Black mothers oftentimes become the mothers of the movement, uh, not because they signed up to be leaders, but because of the death of their sons. So there's something about, you know, people galvanizing around mothers at the death of their sons. It doesn't mean they get justice, but it is interesting to note, you know, some examples. I mean, we see, we think of Trayvon Martin, for example, and we think about his mother. We think about George Floyd, you know, in his dying moments, he's calling out to his dying mother. Um, you think about historic cases like with uh, Emmett Till and the role that his mother played or with the Scottsboro defendant. So lots of things about men, uh, mothers, and sons that some people have explored and I hope to examine also. And then I think about all the consequences of slavery um, and their discussions about reparations in contemporary times and uh, how do we create a more uh, just society. And if you just think about all of the lost, you know, physical bodies, all the lost talent, uh, the psychological trauma. I mean, and the list just goes on. Loss of land, loss of wealth, loss of opportunity, lack of educational opportunities. Just so many things that people are tormented by, by this oppressive uh, system. Uh, and I mentioned violence because there's so many examples of just uh, unimaginable violence. And what's horrific about it is that this is just one story based upon um, you know, uh, one woman's uh, experience and what she thought she needed to do for the benefit of her family. And, but yet it doesn't even really capture how horrifying and how long lasting slavery was. And to think about that you know, can be very um, difficult. 
Um, another term that I wrote down in uh, reading this book is about lynching. Uh, so we see, we, we read about different examples of lynchings uh, throughout the book. Uh, and um, my colleagues and I actually published an article not too long ago thinking about how we might broaden this definition of uh, lynching. So we don't just think about lynchings as in a historical sense um, involving um, hostile uh, people and the death and the physical deaths of black bodies, but also to think about the ways in which there are figurative um, deaths of black bodies even today. So lynching. And then naming. Um, so naming is, seems to be very important uh, in this book as well. Uh, and not only naming, but also um, defining and so uh, and definitions. So in my version of the book, um, I, I wrote down a quote from it that says, um, definitions belong to the definers, not the defined. And so um, is historically black people have really tried hard to control their own images and control their own destinies. Uh, but when you think about the broader power dynamics in society, as we can see in um, this particular um, book, that um, it's really the definers who are uh, able to kind of uh, control the narratives and that uh, historically marginalized groups try to change the conversation. Um, and so also thinking about the address where uh, there, where this takes place on 124 uh, Bluestone. And so I was just curious what people were saying about that because uh, very few things that happen in this book are by accident. You know, she, Tony Morrison could have picked any, any address, right, for this particular house. And, I've, and maybe you all have seen different things, but I've seen in uh, other places where um, it's purposeful that the three is missing because the three represents the third child who was killed. And so that's why it's one, two, four. I don't know if you all have read other things, but I mean, that makes sense. And it's also pretty powerful. And uh, so is Tony Morrison. Um, I've also seen in places where uh, some people have imagined this book, although it is focused on, you know, beloved and the haunting and all of the issues surrounding the um, struggle to leave the uh, system of slavery and so forth, but it also um, being seen as a coming of age story about Denver. So we think about how Denver was so attached, you know, to the home and didn't really seem to be able to live independently with all that she had going on and then um, we see that there's a change and not that she had many choices given what was happening uh, throughout the book but that you know she kind of comes into her own by the end of uh, the novel. Um, I also thought the uh, issue of the carnival was something that could be explored in greater detail uh, and just um, the joy that they had despite all the challenges that they were facing. So that's one thing and how hard it is sometimes for historically um, marginalized groups to find joy in any space. And so including that in this book I thought was interesting as well as looking at the joy that the black people in the town uh, took and um, many of the white people engaged in different uh, activities, but also the fact that they didn't get the full benefit of what would happen on the other days of the week. So it wasn't the same experience as uh, for white people who attended uh, the carnival. I also thought that um, there, there was an impo important message about reproductive freedom. And so there's a scholar by the name of uh, Dorothy Roberts who wrote a book back in the late 90s. Um, and she's still doing fabulous work right now. But this book that she wrote in the late 1990s was called Killing the Black Body. And she just looks historically at all the ways beginning even before slavery, but we'll say starting with slavery, in which Black women's uh, reproductive freedom has been controlled and how that has continued even into contem contemporary times with some of the social policies that we might have and forced sterilization in the past and so forth. So um, having the, and this, not just, we all sometimes focus on uh, black women and the system of slavery, but also the control of, of um, the reproductive freedom of black enslaved men uh, as well. Um, just the meaning of freedom. I mean, so at what point are you really free? If, you know, it's one thing to be able to leave the physical, um, 
the physical chains behind, but um, they're constantly being reminded of all these events and, and how, you know, their mind just doesn't stop working. Um, and they'd like to, you know, forget many of those things, but sometimes your mind just won't let you do that. So just thinking about the, the meaning of freedom and about uh, overall mental well-being. Um, intersectionality is a term that I think is overused, uh, but I will say that uh, originally uh, it was well it was popularized by Kimberly Crenshaw, and it looks at the uh, interconnectedness of of both race and gender. And some would say um, you could add to that a class for Black women, and how you can't really separate them that they're interconnected. Uh, and of course, other people have argued, and I think. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw would um, agree with this as well, is that she wasn't the first to make that connection because of course you have people like Sojourner Truth in the 1850s were saying similar things, recognizing that their experiences were different than that of black men and of white women. And it was, they were unique because they were um, black women. But we get that term intersectionality. And now with um, a booming diversity business, um, you have some people overusing the term and trying to apply it to just uh, lots of things it was never intended to apply to. But I think Tony Morrison, you know, captures it well in this book because she's talking about the unique experiences uh, of Black women uh, throughout the system of slavery and the periods uh, beyond. Not as if they're a monolithic group, but recognizing that their experiences um, were different than that of white women, of white men, and of uh, black men uh, as well. Uh, again, back to the issue of naming. So I oftentimes find that this is um, the case even in contemporary times when, when you hear terms like school choice or opportunity zones, sometimes what it, uh, the way in which those things actually function are the exact opposite. People end up having very few choices and very few opportunities. And so calling the uh, plantation or the a place where um, you know, many of the main characters were once enslaved, sweet home is interesting because as they mentioned in the book, you know, that well, it doesn't sound like it was such a sweet home. And so, you know, why are you calling it that? And so, um, naming things, I think, is really important, and I, and I appreciate how um, Tony Morrison does that in this book. And then just a question I'll throw out that maybe somebody might want to tackle, and just wondering if there were particular characters in the book that you, you all, as readers, were particularly uh, empathetic uh, towards. Um, and then, again, back to the issue of naming and about names, uh, I wrote down Baby Suggs, versus uh, Jenny Whitlow and how um, the man told uh, Baby Suggs basically that her name was actually uh, Jenny Whitlow and um, when she indicated that you know her husband called her baby and that her name is Baby Suggs and that's what she goes by he's basically said you know well that's not um, really an appropriate name for a free black woman and what's interesting about that is that um, you know here's a name that she selected to identify herself that comes from her uh, relationship with her uh, partner and here he is telling her you know that you're a free black woman but that you should carry an enslaved name and so again I think Tony Morrison does a lot of that to make you um, think about that and think about thing, other things uh, more broadly. And then in this moment, um, and with the killing of George Floyd and with so many other people that we can't even list in the time that we have allotted here, I thought it was really powerful um, on page 147 of my text where um, Tony Morrison says that Black men are seen basically as uh, trespassers among the human race. And if that doesn't capture the essence of of what people are calling the Black Lives Matter movement, I don't know what does. And so you think about that, how does it feel or what does it look like when you are considered to be tr a trespasser uh, in the human race? And so clearly you're not considered to be human, you're uh, dehumanized, criminalized. And so just really deep as you read these words that predate a lot of the attention on racial issue issues today. Um, 
Another thing that I found interesting was where um, a line where they were talking about a celebration they had before the um, attack that led to the death of one of the children. Um, and they were commenting on the berries. And then again, this it started off as you know a celebration of like black joy and happiness in these very um, oppressive kinds of um, places. And, and they mentioned that the berries tasted like church. And so I was just, you know, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and that will mean different things for different people, but it was seen as a positive thing. And, you know, it was, uh, there were a lot of references to nature and to natural things as well as supernatural. And so I just thought that that was really interesting that someone would say that, you know, the berries were so good and so satisfying that it tasted like church. And so thinking about you know, well, what does church <laughs> taste like? And what and what does that mean for the people uh, in this uh, novel? What did it mean for Toni Morrison? Um, well, another thing that I thought was important here, which um, some might say is the case even now, um, and that is, and this is my last point, and I'll open it up for discussion, is about the, the press and the media and how they talk about uh, Black people. And so when uh, Stamp Paid is uh, telling uh, Paul D or showing him the newspaper, uh, although Paul D can't really make out what the article says, because clearly it's, he's not uh, literate, but he knows that um, if a Black person is in the paper, it's not a good thing. Uh, because Black people are um, not typically included in the mainstream uh, or uh, read as white press. And so something had to be terribly wrong. And even in the work that, um, that I uh, did on Cynthia Hesdra was another interesting factor is that the only reason we learned about Cynthia Hesdra, remember that's who um, the bench, uh, the Toni Morrison Society dedicated it in her honor, the only reason we know about her is because there was a big uh, court case and a battle over her fortune. Otherwise, we would probably would not have known anything uh, about her because it wasn't common to have uh, positive stories in the press in the uh, late 1800s um, about Black people in general, including uh, Black women. So it's interesting that that comes up. And then some would say, too, that we can see examples of that throughout history. So um, in the early 1900s, uh, as women were still trying to uh, fight for the right to vote, um, you had the Black women's um, movement, uh, Black women and Black Baptist women's movement. Um, you'll see that they're trying to um, control their own images and control their own destinies and trying to fight against things that people were saying about Black women in the press, for example. You fast forward to, you know, things like the Moynihan Report in the 1960s, so saying that the Black family is in a crisis and it's because of uh, Black women. And then some will say now with uh, Joe Biden's selection of, of Senator Harris as his running mate, that we shouldn't be surprised if we start seeing some negative um, uh, uh, representations of Black women and, uh, more broadly uh, in the press. And uh, what's, what's um, sad is that over time there's been a decline in the Black press. So whereas in the past you can try to have some kind of a balance, maybe have something like the crisis with W.E.B. Du Bois or with the um, the um, North Star and other things where uh, there was a counter story to what was being said about uh, Black people, and you just don't necessarily have that. Uh, and so that, I thought that was interesting and telling as well. And so a lot of things that Toni Morrison addresses in this novel, a lot of the themes uh, are very relevant, not only, of course, in, um, during slavery when the novel is set and the period following it, but even in contemporary times, which is why I think the book is just timeless and uh, it's a favorite among many people, both scholars and non-scholars alike. So I'll stop there and open it up for any questions or comments uh, that you all might have. And thank you for listening. I have one while we're waiting. Sure. What do you think about, because the end of the movie has baby Suggs as like the last person that you see, but I think the book ends with um, 
Paldi and Setha. What do you think about that difference? Well, you know, so I think in general that films uh, have a place because, you know, they allow the uh, directors and other people involved with it to uh, have uh, use their creative license to tell a story and it can be based on facts and not or you know based on a book for example and it's their interpretation and so that's their art form and so I don't necessarily want to critique their art but I think it's important for people to read the book <laughs> if, there, if there's a book read the book um, and it's not necessarily meant to compare them right because Jonathan Demi although you know he was in contact with Tony Morrison and over Oprah is not Tony Morris, you know, so his, his viewpoint and what he might want to communicate and what might be more marketable uh, and maybe different to what uh, Tony Morrison does. Uh, and so as, a, as someone who studies race and is a sociologist, you know, also in African, African American studies, people like to tell me, oh, have you seen Harriet? You got to go see Harriet. And I just like, I can't because I'm just going to yell at the screen about things that are not accurate or if there's like uh, some kind of savior mentality that's going on in the movie that's not historically accurate and I just can't take it so, uh, so if there is some kind of movie out there and it's black and historical I probably haven't seen it uh, for for that reason so you know I'm not a film critic if it if, if um watching beloved makes people want to go read the book or learn more about margaret garner or learn about slavery and the choices that some people felt that they had to make that's that's wonderful and we're seeing that happen in this particular moment i don't know how many of you have been on zoom calls or in conversations and um people especially um non-black people who want to learn more or do more sometimes they gravitate towards certain books and films and that does it for them to help them to at least gain some basic understanding before they go to whatever the next level is for them. So they have their purpose and they have their function. Uh, and so that's, that's my perspective on that. Thank you. Sure. And I agree on Harriet. I saw that and yeah, I was like, ah, it's good, but it's worth being accurate. Well, let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Or if you want to raise your hand and speak, let me know and I can allow you to talk. Do you teach this book in your classes or? No, oh, that's a good question. I have um, a number of administrative duties at this time. So I'm actually not teaching this semester and haven't uh, for a couple of semesters, but I did teach it uh, um, along with um, a textbook on race relations for a course that was titled Race Relations. And so in addition to covering all the things that are covered in the textbook. I also had the students to uh, read Beloved. Okay. Um, George is asking, she read this book years ago, but always remembered the narrative says something like, do not pass on this story. So uh, one thing, again, uh, what I think is interesting about this book is that it, um, it challenges us in that it talks about that, you know, that we can't really control the memory sometimes. Like some things we just want to forget about that we don't want to have to engage with. And as much as you try to, um, you know, separate yourself from it, that you don't necessarily have a lot of control over it. Um, and then also the use of the term uh, rememory uh, happens often a couple of times in the book. And just looking at what some people have said about that, some have interpreted that to mean a traumatic memory. And so there's the use of the term memory sometimes, and then the use of rememory. And so just looking at how, uh, again, how 
horrific and how tragic slavery was and how even though it officially ended that it still lived on in so many people and that again is just really powerful and it might be a story that you don't want to tell but it's one that you sometimes can't forget um, angela's asking are there any comparisons that we can make between how these characters are haunted by their past and how contemporary people are haunted by police killings of black men yeah i mean some of you may uh, experience the same thing recently someone posted a video that they said included the moments before when george floyd was first arrested before we see the eight minutes and 46 seconds and i'm like i can't watch this even when the killing of george floyd happened i was saying i'm not going to watch this i refuse to watch it but then i said no i have to watch it uh, and i'm sure there are a lot of people like that you know um if people might refer to these things as um triggers and so it's you know not easy to continue looking at uh black deaths uh, and it's just horrifying and uh, and, and that's, you know, we're, for some of us, our bodies have not been impacted by it, but, you know, emotionally and psychologically, you know, viewing those things can have an impact uh, on us. But imagine the families who are, you know, more direct affected and then again too to remember that some the, the point uh, some would argue if we were to think about these things more broadly and historically within the context of lynching is to terrorize an entire group of people it is to make people uh, like a warning to make people think that this can happen to you or to your group if you don't do X Y uh, and Z and so um, as a whole, when we think about the system of slavery and we think about historic lyn lynching, a lot of this was uh, held together by the threat of violence and of terror. And some might say when you think about um, policing and the relationship with the Black, many people in the Black community today, that there are some similarities. How many of you have heard about, you know, Black people saying that they, they still get nervous when they're driving in their car and the police is behind, um, the police is behind them? And, you know, they don't think they did anything wrong, but they still, this just raises their level of anxiety. And that doesn't necessarily happen for, for all groups. So I think that there are a lot of things that Tony Morrison writes about that are relatable to how people feel and what's going on today. Um, Yvette? I think wants to talk, so I'm going to unmute her. Yvette, you had a question? Yvette, you there? Maybe she's not able to talk. I'm sorry, I was I was carrying groceries and I accidentally touched the button. Oh, okay, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Um, do you think that the book points towards some way to move on past trauma? Yeah, so um, if I think there are different ways and for different characters that that happens and and for some it doesn't happen, right? So for Haley, it doesn't seem that he was able to move past the trauma of seeing his wife uh, so violently assaulted, whereas for Denver, um, you know, she in some ways overcomes the trauma, at least to the extent that she's able to live a, a more independent life. But in some ways, she doesn't have a lot of choices or options. And so, again, I think that's the beauty of Toni Morrison is that it's nothing, it's not like watching a, a episode of a, of a drama um, back in the 80s and 90s where everything is solved by the end of the <laughs> 60 minutes and, and you know, we know that everyone is in a good place by the end of the uh, episode, unless it's to be continued and then it gets resolved right the next time it shows. But for Toni Morrison, life just doesn't operate that way. You, you may not even be able to predict how some people are going to be able to cope with or not cope with um, everything that they've had to endure. And so 
just like those memories that come and go, whether you want them to or not, sometimes we're not able to predict or control uh, the outcomes in life or how we respond to them, which I think also gets to her, you know, play with um, the natural and the supernatural and broadening our understanding about what constitutes uh, religion. It's a great okay. question. I was reading somewhere that they were saying that some people think that Beloved's not actually her daughter and that it's just both of them wanting her to be each other, like being connected. Just curious what you thought about that. Yeah, I mean, lots of different interpretations. I, I think that there are enough examples where Beloved knows things that she shouldn't know um, and that, you know, they believe or want to believe that it's her, um, that um, it's Paul D uh, and other people realize that uh, it's, um, you know, a sad soul that's in the house. And, and so, I don't know, for me, it just seemed like it made sense that it was a beloved, the daughter that was killed uh, in the novel. And also I think it's even clearer, at least in the interpretation of the film, that it's the, it's the uh, daughter. But I guess if there's any point that might make me question it is in the book at the end when the women come and you're able to help to drive her out and then they describe her as having a frame of like a pregnant woman. And so that, is, that might call it into question, but I still, at least my interpretation, it doesn't have to be right, but um, see it as a beloved. And then again, the, the, um, the address that Tony Morrison gave uh, the house, one, two, four, with three missing, it, I think also is a nod to love it. Uh, Angela says, the pain of the past can make people create a reality. I mean, that's... Very true. And for some people, that's their coping strategy is, if, you know, if you don't want to have to feel with the, you know, feel and endure the pain of whatever the trauma may have been, then some you know, people have different ways of dealing with it. And so not dealing with it might be some people's way of dealing with the pain. So yeah, that's a good point. Do you have a favorite um, Tony Morrison book, like curiosity? Um, I was my top, my top three Tony Morrison books are Beloved, Song of Solomon, and Sula. Not in that order necessarily. I think Song of Solomon might be my favorite, and then then Sula, and then Beloved. But those are my top three, uh, and. When I'm usually I'm working on an academic journal article or academic book, and when I'm finished with that and I need to rest my brain and go somewhere else, um, I'm not traveling. I don't, you know, historically travel very much. So I read, I reread Tony Morrison. That's my, that's my escape, <laughs> is the um, escape to a world of Tony Morrison, and it, it works every time. <laughs> Any final questions? Anybody? Okay, wait. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all for joining us um, and share uh, your love for Tony Morrison with others. <laughs> uh, and enjoy the rest of your evening and please be safe. You too. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming.